All right, let's open our Bibles this morning to Psalm 86. We've mentioned to you a couple of times as we've been going through these studies through some of the Psalms that the Psalms are a part of the poetry books in the Old Testament that run from the book of Job and they stop at the Song of Solomon. But they are unique for a couple of things. Obviously, there, there's <clears throat> great depth to poetry by it, to express uh, understanding and feeling, and, and that's cer uh, certainly helpful. But the presumption that these books in particular make is that you are interested in your relationship with God and their application of the truth in them are, are intended to be applied immediately. They are present tense in their application. So you'll be able to take what you learned this morning and put it into practice this afternoon. And, and that really is, is the function of these poetic books. Notice in the introduction, it just simply says a prayer of David. The word tephillah is a word that means to pray, but it is used sparingly in, in the Psalms. In fact, there are only five Psalms in, introduced as that. Three of them David wrote, Psalm 14, uh, 17, this one in Psalm 142. There is a, a Psalm of the Afflicted in Psalm 102 that's kind of ahead of us yet. And then the, the prayer of Moses in Psalm 90. <clears throat> in one way or another, most of the Psalms bring you to praying or seeking God. But these are, are designed by the Lord and set before us as, as prayers that we can study and learn from in terms of our walks with God. David here is facing an, uh, a problem with a multitude of people that want to kill him. You would think that you might find that in verse 1. Hey, Lord, they want to kill me. Instead, you find it in verse 14. David, by the time he gets to the end of the psalm, introduces his need. But by then, he has spent a lot of time considering the goodness of God and the, the, the worry over this violent mob bent on taking his life. David has now seen God sharpen in his understanding significantly. And so the threat is not nearly as bad as it was when he started in proportion to him knowing the Lord. <clears throat> also, since this is a prayer we want to kind of study, there's no indication in the prayer at all that God answered his prayer as yet. So this isn't a prayer that is delivered after the fact, but it is one that, that is delivered in the, current, uh, in the current situation. And the fact that David finds hope and rest and even worship is motivated by faith, unsupported, if you will, by feelings that might change when the situation does. He only had God's word to go on, not able to look back and say, well, the Lord came through. For now, he takes deliberate steps to just stand on God's word and on God's promises. But you, you have been given three, and this is one of the three uh, prayers of a man after God's own heart on how he dealt with his concerns and how he brought them to the Lord. You might be surprised to know that all but two of these verses are, are, are quotes of other portions of scripture. And certainly one of the purposes of prayer, besides the obvious, taking your concerns to the Lord, is the ability that we can have to, to remind ourselves of what God has promised and what God has said. And not just intellectually or, or theologically, but taking those truths and applying them to real life situations. That's really what, what, what prayer does in many ways. It takes what we've learned and it applies us to what we're going through. This is a, a, a prayer of compilation, David's greatest hits, but he was a man uh, after God's own heart. We've mentioned to you a couple of times, and I mention it to you again because you see it in the first three verses, that David's relationship with God was one of understanding. He knew the Lord well, the character of God, and that helps when you go to pray. And we pointed out in a couple of the Psalms that David refers to God by lots of different names that God uses for himself to reveal himself to man as to his character and to his heart towards us. And there are three basic ones that you find in the Psalms. I'll mention them to you again if you weren't here the other weeks. The word Lord, all in capitals, is the translation of four Hebrew consonants. It is either going to be pronounced Yahweh or Jehovah. There's no vows to help us to do that. But it is God's favorite name for himself. He, he takes it to say to us, I'm a God you can count on. And whenever he makes a deal, makes a covenant, makes a promise, he uses this name of himself to say, my word is good. And so God wants us to trust his word, that, that what he says we can count upon. 
The word Lord without the capitals, just the L being capital, is a translation of the word Adonai. And, and Adonai just puts the Lord in a place of authority. I'm the boss, you're not applesauce, you know, that thing. He's in charge. But it does leave us in a position of humility before him, and you find it here as well. And, and the term just God, G-O-D, for the most part in the Psalms is the translation of the word Elohim. Elohim is a name that God uses when he talks about his creative power. But it is used by man to just speak of God's power as evidenced in the fact that he made everything. So a, a covenant God, a Lord overall, a powerful God, David knew him to be such. And because of the character that he knew of God, David finds himself able to come and bring his concerns to the Lord. It's good that you know the Lord well yourself. The other thing I would mention before we get started in is, well, I guess we've started uh, <laughs> before we continue. The other thing that stands out in the psalm is that nowhere in this prayer does David go out of his way to tell God how to fix things. There's not, it's not an instructional prayer to how to solve his dilemma. Instead, he, he comes to the awareness that what he wants to do more than anything else in this situation is come out the other end knowing God better. He, he figures God will handle a problem, but, but I want to know the Lord better. I want to come through this thing with fly, flying colors. He wants to be, in fact, he'll say it at the end of the psalm, I want to be a witness to my enemies and to those who should be ashamed that they had plotted to kill me. Verse 1, and you knew we'd get there. Bow down your ear, O Lord, and help me, for I am poor and needy. Help me because I am poor and needy. I think that ultimately prayer has that intention. We want to make the becoming one, the Jehovah, the, the Lord of promise, the one who makes covenants. We want to know that he hears our concerns and that he is moving to eliminate or to alleviate them. We want God to shake the heavens and to move the earth. We want God to be angry on our behalf and to go before us to pave the way. It is a cry of our hearts. And David starts off by saying of himself, I'm poor and needy, but you are eternal and powerful. And he asks God to humble himself. The words bow down is, is almost, Lord, you know, come down to my level and help me being poor and in desperate straits. And, and, and you get this picture from the Holy Spirit of a cry of the weak on the one end of the line and the earth-shaking God on the other. Lord, if you could just condescend to where I am, where I live, to what I'm going through. And David asked God to hear him while confessing he is weak and unable. Now, that's not all he's going to say. He's going to say in verse 2, I'm holy, which literally, literally means I'm yours. But, but he, he sincerely sees himself as weak. I think that there is probably no worse way of praying than using words of spiritual poverty and yet believing inside you have need of nothing. We, we see that sometimes. People, oh, they're so self-deprecating in their words, but in, in reality, they don't believe it themselves. Dependency will drive prayer's sincerity. Dependency will drive sincerity in prayer. If you really need God's help, it, it's not hard to say, I need your help. And I, I, and I know that I do. And so David finds himself humbled before the Lord. God knows the difference. In fact, in most places in the Bible where you find a people or a nation saying, Lord, um, help us. We are in dire straits. You will read the words, and the Lord heard their prayer. If it is un or driven by something other than that sincerity of heart, you might very well not see that. But God hears the prayers of, of those that are bowed down. He also hears their murmuring. But that's another study that we don't want to get into this morning at all. So David is forced by a bunch of wicked men who would have gladly ended his life, brutal, defiant, ungodly. They hated David. They would have killed him without hesitation. And David realized that he needed the Lord, that the, the problem was bigger than himself, but God was far larger than the problem. So Lord, help me because I'm poor and needy. Second of all, help me because I'm yours. Verse 2 says, Preserve my life, for I am holy. You're my God. 
Save your servant who trusts in you. The word holy means to be separated for one purpose. And in the Bible, it, it speaks about your life being given to the Lord. You've been bought with a price. You're no longer your own. So Lord, I'm in big, big trouble. Help me for that reason. And I belong to you. I've thrown in with you. You've made great promises to me. If you don't help me, no one will. And he asked the Lord to preserve his life. The word preserve means to guard. It's almost like a garrison that gathers around a fort. The New Testament equivalent would be the word keep, uh, protect me. It, it, it's a picture of a defenseless individual who has a very large bodyguard, someone that is able to watch over them wherever they go. Now David specifically will ask that God will protect him from the evil of those who are making plans, but he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to stumble in the process. He doesn't want to waver. God, help me. I, I belong to you. Now, I'm holy is not a proud declaration of self-righteousness. It, it, is, it is a restatement of the fact that God said if we give him our life, that we belong to him. It, it is just a reminder that, look, you're messing with God's properly when you mess with me. I might not be able to defend myself, but the God that I belong to can certainly defend me. And that's how David approached you know, this violent kind of threat to his life. Guard me, Lord, I belong to you. Keep me, Lord, that, that no damage would be done to your vessel and save your servant. Don't just protect me, save me and deliver me. For you are my God, Elohim. You're the, 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 the power behind creation. You're the one who is able. And David declares his confidence in the one who keeps him and knows him. Thirdly, verse three, help me because I'm asking <laughs> or I'm crying out to you. Be merciful to me, Lord. I cry out to you all the day long. This is more than a prayer of a guy who's on his way to donuts in the car and he throws up a quickie. This is a man who is a, in a relationship with the Lord. Help me because I'm poor and needy. Help me because I belong to you. Help me because I am crying out to you all day long. The habit of his life was one of prayer. No settling in, no settling for other solutions. I want to hear from the Lord. There is something to be said in prayer for persistence. You can read in the gospel, especially of Luke, there are two places separated by about seven chapters or so. Uh, chapter 11 and chapter 18, where God tells specific parables relating only to one issue, persistence in prayer. And he makes the, uh, the comparison between a, a, a human kind of inconvenience to respond and God's heart to want to help. The first story you remember was a fellow that was in bed at night with his family and the, and the animals were in the house when a neighbor came over and started knocking on the door at midnight wanting some bread for a, an unexpected guest who had dropped by. And, and the Lord in telling the, the, you know, he said the friend yelled out, hey, look, don't trouble me. The door's shut. The kids are in bed. We can't get up now. You're going to wake up the whole house. And then he said, he wouldn't help you because he's your friend. But if you keep knocking, he'll get up. And he'll get up because you've kept knocking. And then the Lord said, how much more do you think your father in heaven will get up? When you can even persuade someone who's a friend, but not so loyal to you, to move just by your persistence, how much more do you think persistence with God is gonna help you and in your situation? In Luke 18, he tells the story of the unjust judge who had a widow who had a need and she came and he, it says he didn't concern himself with God or man. He was a kind of a, you know, an aloof guy who thought he, he, his, his own power was his own and, and he ignored her. And she, he literally said about her, she can't do me any good. Why should I give her the time of day? But she kept coming every day, every morning. You can see me today. Can you help me today? And, he, and the Lord said, he, he won't help because he's just. He'll help because she won't go away. In fact, he'll say of her, her continual coming wearies me. And then the Lord said again, shall God not avenge those, his elect, who cry out to him day and night, though he bears long with them? I tell you, he'll avenge them speedily. So both of the lessons were the same, like you read of David. God wants you to be able to pray constantly, not because... You need to convince him you need help, not to bother him into responding. That's the way the world works. But, but prayer in per persistence is, is good for you. And, and you should know as you pray, God is anxious to answer. 
So if there's a delay, there's just something better going on than the answer. There's something that needed to take place first because his heart is to help and to respond. I cry to you all day. Help me because I cry to you always. In fact, the words all day long are in the present tense. Well, here's his, here's his confidences. Rejoice the, ser- the soul of your servant. For you, Lord, I lift up my soul to you, O Lord. For you are a good God, ready to forgive, abundant in mercy to all who would call upon you. So give ear to my prayer, Lord. Attend to the voice of my supplication. And in the day of my trouble, I'll call upon you. You'll answer me. Verse 4 said, rejoice the soul of your servant. Which I read to mean David wasn't so happy right now. He wasn't pretending to be something he is not. He wanted to have the right attitude as he went through these things. Lord, can you just give me joy? Even though there's no answer yet, it's not enough for me to just get through the trial. I want to be concerned in how I get through. And I think that's an important issue. Because it's kind of like faith. You know, faith is great. And we're going to go to heaven. But once you get there, you don't need that faith anymore. You're there. Right? So it's how you got there that really matters. Did you trust the Lord every day? You're just hanging on by the skin of your teeth. Same kind of thing in, in prayer. You know, there's trials in your life today. How you get through them is really important. It's it's important to others as they watch you. It's important to you in your walk with the Lord. Did you please God? Were you trusting him when nothing seemed to be working out? How do you get through this thing? So David, without an answer, says, Lord, rejoice my heart. I want to have a joy in you, even though I don't have an answer to prayer, because God, you're a gracious God. I should be joyful whether I get an answer or not, just because of who you are. You're merciful. You're long-suffering. The word good is the, is the Hebrew word tobe. Tobe means to be excellent in virtue or, or valuable in estimation. God, there's never a, a short supply of grace with you or mercy. In fact, he says in verse 5, abundant in mercy to all who call upon your name. David is sure that God is glad to see him praying, that God will respond. In fact, prayer is kind of like living life in the boundaries and confines of where God has put you depending on his promises. You surround yourself with what God has said. That's how you you get through life. And if you'll follow those things, you'll get where God wants you to be. If you've ever been to Venice, there is a small strip of stones that are inlaid into the streets and under the walls in Venice. In fact, Venice is like a maze. If you get off the beaten track or you get on a boat and go the wrong way, you you can be there endlessly. But if you'll follow the red line, you'll end up in the center of town in the piazza where the church was, where the the worship took place. You follow the lines, you'll get to worship. (laughs) You get off on your own, and man, you'll you'll spin around forever. And and you won't really find where where you're supposed to be. Prayer walks where God has spoken. It it depends upon what God has said. And it'll keep you on the right path. It'll keep your heart right as you go. True prayer is kind of like catching in a mirror what God has said and then reflecting it back to him with confidence. Here, the Lord, you've said this. So I, I want joy. You're a great God. And even though I'm under this, this, this terrible pressure, I, I want to react appropriately, right? I, I, wanna, I want you to, to, to know that I trust you. And he even adds in a couple of places, you abound in mercy. You know, sometimes when you go through trials, the first thing the devil will do is try to convince you you brought this on yourself. God doesn't love you so much. God is not for you so much. You know, oh, if, if you were right with God, he'd probably bless you, but look at you, and this is what you deserve. But I read these words, God is ready to forgive. God is ready to forgive. If you, don't, if you buy into the lies of the enemy that God won't forgive, you should go back and read your Bible again. He's ready. He's ready. Well, I've done it a hundred times. Yeah, he's ready. Well, I, I'm not doing it. Yeah, he's ready. Well, yeah, he's ready. He'll stop you in your tracks. He's ready. Abounding in mercy. So give ear to my prayer. And like verse 1, David here cries out again that God would listen to his prayer. But, but he prays it from the understanding of the God that he serves. In fact, he's able to, to conclude in verse 7 that God will answer my prayer. God will answer. Verse 7 is the, is the confidence that came from verse 2 and 3 and 4 and 5 considering the God that he served. There's no... There's no sense in asking for help from someone who can't help you. But the only real place of effective deliverance is when you cry out and wait upon the Lord. So here's David's desire of his own life. He says in verse 7, uh, sorry, verse 8, Among the gods, there's no one like you, Lord. 
There is none who do the works of your works. In fact, all the nations that you have made will come and worship before you, Lord, and will glorify your name because you're great and you do wondrous things. You are God alone. There is none like you. That's a great attitude to have when you go pray. The gods of this world will not compare. The gods of flesh and pleasure and power and money. Oh, we, we give them no names, but they gave them all names in the Old Testament, the idols of the, the days, but they're, they're false gods. In fact, David says in verse 9 as he prays, even the most powerful nations on the planet made by God will one day be on their face before God. He's going to have the last word. How, what a glorious day that will be. And verse 10, the works of God set him apart from everyone else. He's the creator. He's, he's the Lord. He's the savior. He heals the sick and raises the dead and changes human hearts and, and, and promises eternity to all who will believe in him. The words who does wondrous things, again, is in the present tense. This isn't just something I'm looking back towards. This is something God does now. So David's feeling a lot better before he ever gets to his prayer, reminding himself of all that God is and all that God has done. But here's his prayer before even the deliverance that he's longing for. Lord, teach me your ways, that I can walk in your truth and unite my heart that I would fear your name. That's his prayer. In verses 1 through, like, say, verse 7 or so, David desperately is seeking for God's help. But having thought about the God he serves, who he is and what he does, David finds himself with, with an even more important agenda than deliverance, and, and that is, help me to walk with you. I, this, this will pass, <laughs> but I want something that's eternal. I want to begin to walk with you and to know you better, and, and Lord, if you could just unite my heart. The worst thing about our spiritual life is that when, when you are distracted with divided loyalties and then you don't see much spiritual action and you wonder why, the problem flies with us. You know, if, if you're here Sunday morning with a Bible in your hand and, and, and you know, you, you look like you're doing great, but you spend the rest of the week in the world and the Bible goes in the trunk where, where, where you'll be able to find it the next Sunday. And there isn't much of a relationship with God. You, you're living on both sides of the fence and, and you're trying to get by and you want, you want God's blessing, but you don't necessarily want the devotion that's going to be required to find it. You know, that, that's a divided loyalty. That's a hard route, route and a, a hard road, if you say, will, will to walk. But, but if you can just de delight yourself in the Lord and know his ways. I want my way. I, I don't want my way. I want you to teach me your way. Unite my heart. I don't want to be distracted. You know, decisions without dedication leads to a weak spiritual life. The dedication has to be wrapped up into that, that whole equation. And the world wants you to be divided of heart, if you know the truth. They will say to you, well, all right, go ahead and worship, but don't get crazy about it. Or, or go ahead and pray, but, but let's be realistic. Or let's live by faith, but let's also use a lot of common sense. No, common sense is for me, trust God, but not the world. Uh, when when I, Ezekiel was sent by the Lord, I think it's in chapter 11, to, to speak to the children of Israel in captivity for their sin, the Lord said to them in not so many words, I've, I've scattered you amongst the nations of the Gentiles, but I've made you a small island in their midst. And there is coming a day when I'll give you a new heart and a new spirit that you can walk with me. And, and a stony heart I'll take out of your heart and I'll give you a heart of flesh. His promise was though they lived in the world and they were surrounded by it, he isolated them from the world around them by his spirit, by his work. That's what God would want for us. David wanted that as well. So teach me your ways. Lord. I just want your ways. I want to walk in your truth. I want my heart on board with your plans. In fact, verse 12 is one of those willful decisions. I will praise you, Lord my God, with all of my heart. You are Elohim, you are Adonai, I will give it all to you. And notice that his worship was not based on deliverance from the worry, or the worry of verse 14. It is rather a worship that is driven by his knowledge of God simply by faith. David was going to take steps to enjoy his understanding of God by faith 
and leave the problems with him, but not be overwhelmed by them so that he missed out on what God and who God was. In fact, in verse 2, David called the Lord my God in prayer. In verse 12, he calls him my God in worship. Recalling the, the greatness of God, verse 13, great is your mercy towards me. You've delivered my soul from the death of, of the grave or of the depth of hell, if you will. Look, you've, you've saved me for all of eternity. This isn't going to be so difficult. Well, finally, in verse 14, David turns to his concern. And he says, oh God, the proud have risen against me and a mob of violent men are seeking to take my life. And they have not set you before them. This is a rebellious work. That was his, the reason we, we got to verse 1. That's the reason he fell on his knees to begin with. But look at, he sees things so more clearly now. His relationship with God has been reviewed. His understanding of God's character and sovereignty reminded. He's considered the word that God has spoken. He, he's determined that one way or the other he's going to worship even when he has no answer yet or, or sees no d deliverance. He's going to be wholehearted in his approach. And then he gets to verse 14. <laughs> There's a lot God can do in you in prayer before he gets to answering it, and a lot that he wants to accomplish. But now he knows the, the, the problem looks far, more, uh, far less, I should say, severe, and God looks more awesome than ever. So he says in verse 14, look, the problem I'm having is with people. They're, they're proud, they're violent, they're, they're set upon destruction, my destruction. They don't consider you, but I will. They aren't moved by you, but I am. And they want to bring suffering. And then he said this, Lord, I know that you're a God filled with compassion and grace and long-suffering and abundance and mercy and truth. Again, you're abounding in mercy. If you thought for one minute that, you know, the word mercy means not getting what you deserve. If David thought for one minute that this was going on because he deserved it uh, or, or God wanted him to, you know, punch him for it, then he might very well turn away. But God is merciful. He doesn't give us what we deserve. He gives us grace. That's what we don't deserve. And, and David lived that kind of life. I, I get it. I get that everything I have and I get is by a gracious act of God who has sent his son to stand in that place where, where he can offer me mercy as well. I'm off the hook, if you will. I'm off the hook. But you, Lord, are a God full of compassion. Notice the word, but you, Lord. I, I'm convinced uh, the last six or eight weeks as I've been going through Psalms, that I'm going to do, a, if the Lord tarries, I'm going to do a message last, next Easter on, on the message, but God. Now, if you go through the Bible and you look up, but God, when, when it comes to a statement of truth or fact, and then you read, but God, there are hundreds of them. We could start our series on that and maybe end in Easter. I mean, there's just a lot of them. But I want to do that if, unless the Lord tarries. So if you don't like that message, don't come Easter. It's the one I'm doing. No, I'm kidding. Just come anyway. Verse 15 is, is by the way, a, a verbatim quote from Exodus chapter 34. When the Lord was speaking to Moses at Mount Sinai about his character and giving them the law and his deliverance for them. Here, stand on the word. That's literally what David said. Lord, I'm going to stand on your word to me. So Lord, turn to me. Have mercy upon me. There's the third time it's mentioned it. Give strength to your servant and save the son of your maid servant. And so show me a sign for good that those who hate me and see it may be ashamed because you, Lord, have helped me and, and comforted me. David ends his prayer by asking for God's strength to stand in the face of this and to be encouraged. Give me a good sign that you're with me and you're working. In the end, I want to be a good witness. I want to be a witness to my enemy. <laughs> you might pray, I want them destroyed and dead like tomorrow. That would be, amen, in Jesus' name. <laughs> Makes good sense. David went, I want to be a great witness. So when, when they see your hand upon my life and how I've handled this and trusted you, they're going to be ashamed that they went down this road at all. He wanted to be sure that God was honored through it all. Keep me going, Lord. Give me a sign for good. Encourage me along the way, but, but use my life so the wicked might be ashamed. Good verses and lots to apply. I hope that the Lord will help you in your prayer life as well. I'm not done. No, I, <laughs> I heard a lot of zipping. I, verse 18. 
next week. Father, we thank you this morning for your goodness to us, how faithful you are, and how blessed we are to belong to you. And like David, may you teach us more about how prayer can change our walks as we consider your word and who you are and what you've said, and how it can then be applied to our present tense way of life. If this morning you're going through lots of stuff, come and pray with one of the pastors. Let's, let's just leave it with the Lord together. Even going over what we led the, read this morning. If you don't know the Lord at all, that's really where life begins. Until you go to Jesus and have that bridge gap, that, 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 that chasm that sin has put between you and God that you can't, you can't bridge. You're really never going to have a relationship with God and you're, and you're going to, if, if it's not resolved, stand before him in judgment and hell's a real place. David said, you've delivered my soul from death, from hell. God wants to deliver your soul from that as well. So come and talk to the pastors about what it means to, to come to Jesus and, and allow his work for us to save us, even as he's promised. You can ask him before you go home. But may the Lord help you to pray well and to find that the greatest answer to prayer oftentimes is not the solution of the problems that drove us to our needs, but to the change that God brings to our lives because we have looked to him. It's the place God starts. He does the first thing first and the best thing first. And you're the best thing to him. Shall we stand?